Good evening. Good evening. It's hard to believe it's been four years. Uh, I can't remember if it was here or close to here or where we were, but it's just amazing to see what God is doing at TCBC and uh, just how the church is growing. A lot of familiar faces. Uh, some were like this, now like this, you know. And like me, some were like this, now they're like that. <laughs> uh, but it's just a joy. You know, there's different feelings as we think about churches that, that have been praying for us and supporting us. And uh, when I think of TCBC and Nick and the leadership here, just I, I think of the seminary and, and CBC. And these, these are our people. These, you are, you're our people. And it's just such a joy to be back. Uh, it's hard to believe after four years and to see what God is doing. And now nine years. It's your ninth anniversary. So I feel uh, blessed to be here because it's encouraging. You know, it's the same line. We're just a little bit behind you. But uh, good to see that God is faithful in building His church. And there's an, not just this church, but there's a network in Northern California of, of good people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to proclaim Him. And um, yeah, um, I don't know if uh, some of you remember initially when we returned after I graduated from the Cornerstone Seminary 2011, uh, we were planning to be not where we are. I was joking this morning that um, uh, we're good Calvinists and we didn't have a plan B. You know, but uh, we were planning to be on the northeast of India. There was a group there and, and uh, through the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, it became clear that this was not going to work out and we ended up, by God's grace and providence, in Pune. This is my home a town where I grew up, where my dad is a pastor in the, uh, the main city. And uh, by God's providence, uh, we planted a church in the middle of well, the summer of uh, 2012, starting in our home. We moved to the outskirts of town, and uh, there was a group there that, that seemed interested in, in uh, a Bible study, and we thought, let's just go. This is what we're here for. And uh, the outskirts of Pune, uh, just to give you some context, the outskirts of Pune is a, is a place that 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was nothing there. And um, all of the development uh, today that we see is because of the IT boom. And about 10, 15 years ago, uh, these international corporations and big Indian companies came up and set their uh, centers there. And so there was a huge influx of people all from all over the country coming in to Pune for jobs, many of whom you uh, end up talking to on the phone. Right? <laughs> How can I help you, sir? <laughs> but just think of us. Don't be frustrated. Just think of us. You know that they're probably in our neighborhood. And we're trying to reach out to those kind of people. And so, uh, uh, as a result of that, um, it's really an unchurched area as far as English-speaking churches, because these are educated people, uh, trained people, coming for jobs. And, um, and so we moved there uh, with the hope of uh, starting a church in, in that kind of a community. And there was a group that was supposed to join us, who didn't end up joining us. But by God's providence, we started in the home with four or five people. And uh, fast forward three and a half years later, we now have a home that we rent. And we have about ten families. And God is really blessing the church. And that's really my main vision, my main um, uh, goal by God's grace and His enablement through the Word and the, the preaching of the Word is to see a, a model local church planted. You know, all the other ministries are important, but not out of the context of a good local church. And you all would know this and, and believe this. And so that's my main mission as far as I am concerned and Arpita is concerned. Um, but it's good to see as the church grows that the Lord is opening up opportunities for us to begin to reach out to the community. Um, beginning of last year, when we moved out of our home, uh, we had started meeting in hotels, and, and we connected with uh, a, a young lady who uh, works in a, a social organization that deals with uh, HIV-positive kids who've been thrown out, abandoned by their families. And she started attending, she found us online. We have a web website, and then um, weeks later she said, uh, I work with these kids, can I bring them uh, to church? I said, we, we have an English service, but if, uh, the older ones can understand, sure. So five or six kids started coming. They didn't understand anything. And, um, but then we began talking about uh, doing a children's ministry. Uh, 
So we had 15 people and then she brought, she used to bring all these kids, 10, 15 of them, 15 adults and 15 kids, you know. Uh, and just, it's amazing to see how God just is bringing us uh, people who don't know Christ, uh, who we can minister to, and uh, uh, there's different opportunities. And, and one of the things that has been happening, uh, uh, Nick mentioned a video uh, that was two years ago, two years ago, or three years ago, probably three years ago. Um, we've been able to, not just our, us, but in partnership with like-minded churches that are part of our network, Angelo, uh, served at the pastoral training seminary in Goa. You, you, you might remember that. And uh, connected with the seminary and my church and uh, my dad's church. And it's been neat to see a partnership of like minded people organizing things like the conference that the video came from, the National Expositors and Family Conference we have every summer, and pastors and their families from all over the country come, maybe 100, 150 pastors, and then 100, 150 kids. And we do Sunday school for them and just want to equip them, uh, show them a model uh, verse by verse teaching and, and the effectiveness and the passion of uh, good expository preaching, but then also equip and encourage. And then uh, three years ago, um, I was able to spearhead along with uh, a few other like minded young men. Um, we created a team, uh, a conference for young adults that we hold every August. We've just finished our a third conference, Awake Conference, this year, this August. And again, it's uh, young adults, 17 to 30, from all across the uh, state and, and a few from across the country. And, and we just want to equip them, um, disciple them in a brief time, and, and, and really show ourselves as we're a resource. If you're serious about following Jesus, we're here and we want to equip you. And it's been amazing to see people get saved. And um, last year, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, in the morning last year, we had a Hindu girl uh, who gave her testimony this time, and she said she got saved at the Awake Conference last year. And so it's amazing because to think about how small we are, um, it can be intimidating. I'll give you uh, a little bit of uh, a picture of this. We are a church of about maybe, what, 35, 40 people. We serve in a city of 10 to 15 square miles, a uh, population maybe 6 million. You know, and 80% are Hindu, 12% Muslim, there's minorities, and then 2% all Christian groups. And so it could be intimidating when you think about it that way, isn't it? Uh, but the gospel is God's power for salvation. And it's amazing to see four years later we're still there and free to serve and God is blessing. And, and you're a part of it as you pray for us, as you support us. Um, and so be encouraged. And uh, I'm encouraged, actually, being here this morning, because, again, you're, I'm looking ahead, you're in nine years, you're there. And we're, we're going to be there, Lord willing, someday. Maybe slower than nine years, but we'll be there if the Lord blesses. And we just are faithful to His mission, His uh, structure, His principles, His guidelines, you know. Keep it simple. And so, be encouraged, but um, it's just a joy to be here uh, and celebrate with you. and. I want to go to God's Word. That's the best place to be. Uh, we are in uh, our studies back in Pune in the book of Philippians. And so that's what I've been uh, preaching in, in uh, California. And I want us to be in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. This is sort of an encouragement to you, to you all to keep on keeping on. Um, uh, as you reflect back on nine years uh, in God's faithfulness. Uh, Philippians 1, verse 27. Paul says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and I'll continue reading. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that from God. Let's pray. Father, I need your help. I need your spirit. Would you come? And would you empower me, energize me uh, to be a vessel that speaks what you want us to hear? Give us uh, spiritual ears, and humility, and a softness of heart to receive your word. In, in whatever you want to say to us. 
Bless this time, Lord. Be present among us, we pray in Jesus' name. When I preach this, uh, uh, I talk, uh, the title that I uh, uh, used in India was Picturing the Christ-Centered Life. But I want to change that a little bit and, and, and title it Christianity for the Rest of Us. And I'll tell you what, Christianity for the Rest of Us. Um, but before that, I, I came across a few um, epitaphs on tombstones that might be humorous. Here's one. These are old, I think. Here lies John Ross, kicked by a horse. <laughs> How's that for an epitaph? <laughs> Here's one from a husband. I plant these shrubs upon your grave, dear wife, that something on this spot may boast of life. Shrubs may wither and all earth must rot. Shrubs may revive, but you, thank heaven, will not. <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Here's one for the wives. Here lies my husband. What else is new? <laughs> Can you imagine people actually put these on tombstones? Um, here's a terrible one. Poorly lived and poorly died. Poorly buried and no one cried. Um, um, speaking of death, not to get too morose, but you've probably heard the story of Alfred Noble. In, 18, in 19, no, 1889, I think it is, uh, Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel woke up one morning and he read his own obituary in the local newspaper. It went as follows. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. Now it transpired that it was in fact Alfred's older brother who had died, and the newspaper reporter had got his facts wrong. But for Alfred, it was a blessing in disguise and a wake-up call. It had a profound impact on him. He hated the idea of being remembered for developing the means to kill people eff eff efficiently and for amassing lots of money. So he initiated the Nobel Prize, the award for scientists and writers who foster peace. What will be your epitaph? What will be on your tombstone? What will you be known for? Now, if you look at the context of Philippians chapter 1, Paul has been reminding the Philippian church of his own testimony, his own confidence. And you have these amazing uh, statements. Even in the middle of his great suffering in prison in Philippi, he, he talks about rejoicing in the proclaimed gospel that Christ is exalted. And then he makes that amazing statement in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Something that we put up as, as a plaque in our homes maybe. He's epic, isn't he? Paul is epic. I want to be like Paul, but I know I can't be. This guy is too much. It makes the rest of us feel miserable, isn't it? How could somebody have that kind of resolve and that kind of commitment? You feel very small sometimes. And I think of myself, you know, I represent, you know, the missions aspect of your church. And sometimes I'll come in and what am I going to say? I'm going to say, commit your life to missions. You know, what are you doing wasting your life in Sacramento? Give your life to Jesus, that kind of thing, you know. And we can almost create a spirit. I come from India, we have a caste system. And we can almost create a spiritual caste system where you have the top of the rung, uh, are, are, the second rung will be the pastors, maybe. But the top of the rung are the pastors who are cross-cultural missionaries, you know. And then you have, maybe lower down, the, the everybody, you know. And we're just sort of here to facilitate. We're just here to facilitate the real work that's going on. And I don't think that's, that's, that, that sort of inadequate thinking uh, is, is right for us to get from the scriptures. And, and while, while when you read the scriptures and, and you, you get that sense of a, a, a burden, if, if, God, if God works in your heart and, and some of you uh, are, are beginning to see God's spirit work in you to, to give up things and commit your life to that kind of work, 
And I don't want to be the one to stop that. It may mean giving up your career for the sake of the gospel. It may mean moving to another country for the sake of the gospel. It may mean making what people call big sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. But the point is that not everybody is called to that. And it doesn't mean that if you're not called to that, you're not important as far as the mission of the church. Not everybody gets up and, and becomes a missionary. But the Holy Spirit tells us through these passages, I think, that what must be radical is this Christ-centeredness wherever we are. Wherever we are. In everything, Christ must be preeminent. Wherever you are. Don't settle wherever you are for less than eternal joy. And it's interesting because Paul, after talking about himself, then he moves in, in our verse, verse 27, to, uh, from personal testimony to not talk about the application of that mindset in the Christian life. Not everyone lives a radical life. Not everyone is called to start an orphanage somewhere in a mountaintop in Chile or something like that. You know? And sometimes we romanticize that. So what does it mean for the everyday normal Christian for Christ to be everything? I think there's some pointers in this text. And I see visual. I, I, I'm more visual. And I think there are three visual cues in this text that, that help us. Um, and there are three images, I think, that we can pick out from here as Paul talks about the Christian life, the Christ-centered life, life. The citizen, the soldier, and the athlete, the team player, the athlete. So let's look at the first one, verse, the beginning of verse 27. The citizen. And this first point is, in whatever you do, live worthily for Christ. And the picture is the citizen. He says, only behave... As a citizen, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Identity is important, isn't it? We hold a high value on status. We find our identity in our status. And, and status is often tied to rights and privileges. So, for instance, you might have a military identification and it opens up gates that are not open to others. You have some status. And within the military, if you have, for example, what was it, um, a Navy SEAL identification, then the gates are even more restricted. Gates are open to you. You see? You have rights and privileges that normal people don't have. And, and, and all of this, the rights and privileges, right or wrong, brings a certain level of respect. For example, you live in the United States, the superpower in the world, having a U.S. passport wholesome status in the world. And so when Americans travel outside and get in trouble, what do they say? But I'm an American citizen. Like a, like a helicopter is just going to drop out of the air and, and rescue you. And maybe it will. I don't know. You know? And, 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 and the issue is if something is worth identifying with, it is worth representing well. It is worth honoring well. Don't we get upset when we think about like I, I think about Indians traveling overseas and they misbehave and say, you're representing our culture badly. It's the same thing with your people, right? Represent your people well. And I think that's what Paul is trying to portray here as he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The picture is citizenship. Just as we would understand this idea of identity well, Paul speaks to the Philippians in their own language. Literally, the statement there is, only behave like a citizen. It may not show up in your English, but that's the, the statement there. Only behave as a citizen worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's significant to the people that Paul is writing to, the Philippian church. You see, Philippi is a colony in, in Macedonia. It's a Roman colony in Macedonia. So the area is not a Roman area, but the place Philippi is a place that was considered a Roman colony. And so the people in that city, who were born in that city, had rights and privileges. They had status as far as the world is concerned. In that age, to be a Roman citizen was like today, being an American citizen. It's something like the old, you remember the old Hong Kong? It changed in the late 90s. But you remember Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was a British colony right till the late 90s. 
And so if you're born in Hong Kong, you had the option of taking a British overseas passport. And the British passport was considered status, you see? So you're in China, but you have the freedom and the rights of a British citizen. That's sort of the idea of Philippi. And so Paul is using a picture these people know. They, the church, people in the church probably were proud of who they were as Roman citizens. So he uses the same language to remind them of something greater. To live as citizens. And I'm not talking about being a Roman citizen. Philippians, you might be proud of who you are as far as the material plane goes. But remember, if you're in Christ, you belong somewhere else. You're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. You belong to somebody else, another king. You, re you represent elsewhere, not here. Live representing that place, that king, worthily. This country, this place is temporary, Paul has said. This identity, whatever we might gain, and in chapter 3 he says, law, uh, whatever we gain is actually lost in, in, in light of the surpassing excellency of Christ. Right? Whatever we might gain is temporary. And in the meantime, in this temporary place, what is our goal? It is to make sure the, that the way that we live represents our king in such a way that he is exalted and he is seen as beautiful in this world. That's your purpose. That's your purpose. To live worthily of the gospel of Christ, the king. To live in such a way that upholds the worthiness of our citizenship is a gospel advertisement. Live in such a way that people are drawn to Christ because of your life. And if heaven is our citizenship, then what's our constitution? Right? The gospel. It's the book by, by which we live. Our guide, our rule book, our pattern to live in accordance with the gospel of Jesus. I used to notice that when I was a kid, we'd have visitors from other countries, usually from the Western countries. Um, I, would excite, I would get excited because there was something about them, you know, the way they smell, the way they, that just excited you to go and see what they carry, who they are, where they come from, the stories. You see? And this is the expectation from us to live in such a way wherever we are. You don't have to travel across countries to be the aroma of Christ to a watching world. You can smell like Jesus anywhere. Paul is saying, do that. Live worthily where you are. And that is commendable in the kingdom. Exalt Jesus in every aspect of life. So that people are won by the smell of who we belong to. This king, right? There should be this radiation from you that there is a king that I honor. And he is worth honoring. He is a king who delivers from sin. He has delivered me from sin. This is, this is not the kind of king. I was just in England on the way here. And you know the feudal system where everybody served the king. This is not that kind of a king. This is a king who is exalted above all. Yet this king works for me. This is the kind of place I want to belong to. This is the kind of citizenship I love. Right? Honor the king. He works for us. He died so that I might become a citizen. He won my citizenship. I could do nothing to enter in. He works for me. He lives to protect my citizenship. I can do nothing to keep my citizenship. But by His power, He lives to protect it for His glory. And He offers freely through me this gift to all. Paul is saying, live worthily. Live as a citizen of this heavenly kingdom the subject of this mighty, exalted King Jesus, wherever you are. Now, you're here to cele celebrate the ninth anniversary of TCBC, but are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Do you belong to Jesus? Have you known Him? Have you experienced His power? Have you seen His grace? Have you seen the bondage broken of sin in your life? This King can do it. I don't want to escape here not calling you if you don't belong to Him, to know Him. Because it is, it is, it is an obsession with, with a relationship with a King that is all satisfying and all fulfilling. 
know him, like call out to you this, morning, this evening. Are you a citizen? But the point that Paul is making uh, for Christians is live worthy of the gospel, which is your heavenly constitution. Live a Christ-centered life. Radiate him wherever you are. Point to a great Christ. And it's for us to examine. It's always good for me to, to do it, for, for when I call my congregation to do it. Because the gravity, we live in such a world, isn't it, that the gravity is always shifting us away from the center. And so re-examine your life. Look at your goals. Look at your family. All of your priorities. Is the center Christ the King? Are you living in a manner that exalts Christ? Or are you living just like everybody else? But you've got the tag, I'm a Christian. That's not it. Christ is far more glorious than that. Will it be said of you, whether it's you individually or for this church, that they valued their identity, they did not squander it. Christ was seen, exalted in them, among them. So whatever you do, live worthily for Christ. Secondly, in verse 27, that's the picture of the citizen, the citizen of heaven. A picture of the soldier. Whatever you do, stand unshakably for Christ. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. And I want to come at this uh, indirectly and talk about the priority of growth. If you're in the corporate sector, you know, I, uh, I'm working among professional. Growth is a big buzzword. Everything is about growth. Growth. Everyone talks about growth in my job, in my profile. I need to work so that I'm having growth. Growth in this, growth in that. People are obsessed every waking moment. Growth, growth this, growth that, and I need to expand and, you know, and it can affect everything. And some of this is well and good and even necessary to live as we live in this world, but Paul is reminding us, I think, as he talks about standing fast, standing firm, that much more there is a growth that is not optional as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, which citizens of heaven must pursue. Now, I, I see there's no word growth here in the text. Whether I, whether I come or see you, I'm absent. I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, but, so why am I, why, why am I connecting the two things? I, I think it works like this. You think of Ephesians chapter 4. We can go there. Turn a few pages. Paul does talk about growth. He speaks about maturity of growing up into Christ. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. He talks about the leaders in the church that are given, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For what? For building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the mature and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to what? Grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. You notice, who doesn't stand firm in this text? Babies. Babies. I have a child now, right? And she's got the wobble, you know. Even a few months ago, her head wouldn't, you know, sit still. She had no stability at all. And that's what he's saying. To not anymore be children in order that you may be mature to stand fast, you've got to grow up. And what's the means in this text? He says what? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. So what's the means for growth? The truth, the gospel, the word of God. And so before we can get to Philippians chapter 1, where he's saying, I want to see you standing firm, there's an assumption, isn't it? That's not a, a, a snap of the finger sort of thing. Oh, now I'm standing firm. You've got to grow up from infancy through the word of God into Maturity where you can stand firm. You see? You see? Some of us are so obsessed with personal growth, and maybe now you're doing well there, and we praise the Lord for that. It's not 
uh, that one or the other. It's, it's not like that. But, but I, I see this even in our people back home that, that we get so obsessed with personal growth that we have squeezed out any time for our own spiritual growth in the church. Through the word of God, by the spirit of God. And there is no growth in that area, individually and corporately, so that we are in danger of being struck down. He even talks about that in, in, back in Philippians chapter 1. You're standing firm. And then verse 28, he then talks about the coming affliction, opposition. You see, people who are not growing in the Lord and, and beginning in the gospel to stand firm are going to be hit by the storm of, affli of affliction. To grow up. The purpose of God's truth is so that the Spirit can use it to grow us up, mature us, sanctify us, change us, make us more like Jesus, make us more affectionate towards Him so that He is bigger in our lives. And we stand firm, fixing our gaze on Him. And that's where I think that the, back in Philippians chapter 1, the picture of the soldier is helpful. He says, Step... Standing firm, but how? So that whether I come and see you or am absent, Philippians 1.27, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side. Consistency. Whether I come or I am absent, whether he sees it actually or he hears from a distance, they're standing firm. It's a growth that is real. It's a growth that is not pretend. It's a growth that is consistent. I come from India. And we honestly, I guess we should, but we don't respect our police officers and, and people in power, government officials, because the mentality is always, if my boss is watching me, then I look like I'm working. You know? But otherwise, whatever. And I like what Paul is uh, picturing here. Whether I come or I'm absent, whether he sees or hears from a distance, as the commanding officer here, he's saying, you are faithful, you're standing firm. Whether or not anybody's there to look at you, your, your uniform is clean, your equipment is checked, you're prepared, ready, whether or not anybody's going to come and look at you. You're trained, you're fit, you're ready. You're standing firm in the gospel of Christ. And what Paul seems to be telling us is that like a dutiful soldier, the Christian who lives worthy of the gospel is not just once in a while, you know, Sunday go to meeting time, praise the Lord, hallelujah, but then I have no other faithfulness. I have no nourishment in God's word. No consistency. Not like that. It's not just once in a while prepared. But consistently in the truth of God's word. So that you're ready at any moment. That's what a soldier is prepared for, right? Because the, the enemy, opposition, the onslaught doesn't announce itself. Right? Coming a week from now at 7 p.m., well, let's make it 7.30, we'll finish our dinner first, then we'll come and attack you. That's not how the enemy works. Right? Unshakable steadfastness. And when you're anchored in Christ as a consistent way of life, then when the onslaught comes, whether it's suffering or whether it's opposition, whatever it is, from within or without, you're standing firm, deeply rooted, unshakable. And so I think that's the point here as we look at the, the picture of the soldier. Grow into a point in your own uh, study, in your own walk with Jesus, through His Word, into a deeper, consistent relationship with Him, so that you are not an infant, but you're standing firm, anchored to Christ. Have you left room? Examine your life. Where is the priority for growth in Christ. Does the Word and the Spirit have plenty of room in your life? Because if not, when the war comes, like in Philippi, there was disunity in the church. When conflict comes, when trouble comes, you will not be ready. You will not be able to stand. Whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm 
in one spirit. Standing for one spirit. And then the third picture of the team athlete. Whatever you do, strive unitedly for Christ. Whatever you do, strive unitedly for Christ. That's the third picture here. Continue. Standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. When you're fixed on something, when you're committed to something, you give it your full attention. It takes all your exertion. Some of you have these uh, pursuits, whether it's uh, uh, well, the, the picture here is an, an, an athlete, or, or even if it's, it's music or something like that. You you work hard, but as far as uh, team team sports, which I think is is a picture that we can use here, you don't work by yourself for yourself. You work together with the team so that the team can profit together. And when we look at the Christian life, it's not an individual thing. You know, we tend to have more and more these days a sort of a celebrity mentality and we put people up on a pedestal and these are the workers for Christ. But that's not the picture of, I mean, even what uh, Nick read earlier from Romans chapter 12. The body is made up of various parts and each one has its spirit gifted place so that, that the church can be effective. The Christian life is not an individual work. It's a commitment within the context of the local church. Notice the words there, the unity words. He says, all of you individuals together working, you have one spirit. So you have individually, I am saved by and I grow in the spirit. But then all believers grow together and stand together in one spirit. And he says, one mind or one heart. As you grow individually in community you grow in, in, into a unity of, of purpose you have a common goal you have a common mission you're committed to the same thing as you gaze at Christ you recognize that all of the local church together are gazing at the same thing we're, on, we're in this together we're, we're fighting for the same thing and it's not just one local church I think about even your partnership with us in India we have the same goal we're working towards the same thing we're proclaiming Christ. You know, I was, I was talking about this this morning, that the forms may look very different. The outward thing may look very different. But the heart of it is the same. We want to see Christ exalted. We want to proclaim the King. The striving side by side in the team. If you're a citizen of heaven, if Christ is your savior, if you see yourself, that's my main mission, I'm his emissary, and all the other things need to rotate around that solar, that, that solar system. It means that you see yourself inseparable from all others who are involved in the mission of the gospel. And when we look at this language of Paul, I may hear of you that you all are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I get the sense, even, even in his later comments about individuals like Epaphroditus and, and, and Timothy, and he talks about them as fellow workers. He doesn't have an idea of a hierarchy that one is more important than others. The, the work is different. Each one's work is different. But there are no less or more important players on the team. The purpose is all the same. And all contribute to what? He says, in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is shorthand, like Jude says. Jude uses the same term, the faith of the gospel. And it refers to the body of truth handed to us. All that the gospel represents of the person and the work of Christ. His glory, his power, his majesty, his deliverance. You fight for that in the world together. This is amazing to think about. Paul speaks of Epaphroditus as a, as a fellow soldier and, and, and in, in, in chapter uh, 2. And it's amazing to think about who is Epaphroditus and who is Paul? Right? Paul is the apostle. Epaphroditus would have been a nobody had he not been mentioned in the scriptures. But Paul says he is my fellow soldier in the battle for the gospel. 
And in the same way, all of you here today who belong to the Lord Jesus are fellow soldiers. Each one of you has been gifted by the Lord Jesus Christ through His Spirit with an effectiveness by His power, through His grace, to be used of Him for His kingdom purposes. It's not just the pastor, it's not just the elders, it's not just the missionary that you're like your cheerleaders for. Oh, you do the work. We'll support you with our money and we'll work hard in the world. That's not the point. All of us contribute. All of us are Christ pro proclaimers. All of us are part of this team. We may have heroes. I, we, we love cricket in India. And there's this famous statement, you know, whenever the captain is interviewed after a, a win or something like that, the more humble captain will say this. He say, the captain is as good as his team. The captain is as good as his team. Without the team, the heroes are nothing, right? What is the hero going to do? Run around by himself, you know, and try and win? All in the team are important if the game is to be won. And all work hard for that cause. And it is the same for the believer. You, brothers and sisters, are part of the team. You may not feel like it, but that's the reality. You're all part of this one body that is built to exalt Christ. Strive together with the body. Remember this. As Paul speaks to the Philippians, it applies to us as well. You're not subsidiary to the mission of God. You're not subsidiary. God has placed you where you are with a purpose for His glory. You are God's gift to this church. Sort of like that? We don't want to self-exalt, but that's, that's true. God saves people and gives them to the church so that they may effect, be effective for His glory. There's no more um, bigger way of, of magnifying our worth in one sense to think about the fact that God has put me in this place to be used for His kingdom, for His, for his exaltation. I have a place here. I have an important place here. I have an essential place here. Examine your life again. Where is your labor invested? When you look at the people in your life, when you look at what you think of as your team, is it just, you know, work? Or do you see this group of Christ-loving citizens of heaven? They are my team. And whatever else I do, it is to make sure that they are helped, that they are strengthened, that we work together for the eternal mission of King Jesus. You exist as an envoy for Christ. The local ch church exists as your team. And I know that this is as relevant here in Northern California as it is in India, isn't it? Because we get so easily distracted. The world and its press is so large and there are so many joys and so many missions and so many purposes that seem so significant that we get lost in them even as believers. And it seems urgent. But the thing is, as we come back to the center and Christ's mission and Christ's glory and Christ's salvation, that we realize all of those things, though important, are not eternal, isn't it? And so where are you in the scheme of things? Alfred Nobel, as he thought about his own life, he said, every man ought to have a chance to write correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. That's God's grace for us because we can always change by His grace, direction, as we reflect. I think about the three, the three pictures here in this text. To walk worthily, walk as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. That's our purpose, isn't it? The center, the white hot center, the direction... The, the, the magnet that I am drawn to in all things is the glory of King Jesus. 
and the proclamation of His name. I have a purpose. Stand steadfast. That's the means. Through the word of God, by the spirit of God. That helps me be anchored to King Jesus in this mission. Through the word. And, and then finally, striving together. That's the sphere. I'm not on my own out there with the truth of God's word trying to defend King Jesus. No, he is building a church. And I'm a part of this. I have a team that we are all in this together. And as we are faithful to that cause... Nine years will become maybe 18 years. And 18 years, maybe 40 years. And maybe people will begin to say that there are, there is a massive gospel presence in Northern California. You see? Wouldn't that be amazing? You see? What I'm saying is not complicated at all. Is it? Right? And so, nine years down the line, just as I've encouraged my flock three and a half years down the line, I just want to say, stay the course. I know you're already on this course. But keep examining your center of gravity and continue to focus it on King Jesus and His mission. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you is your weak servant. You are, you are mighty. You are glorious. You are the Savior. You are the king. And what you determine to do in this world, you will accomplish. When you determine to save souls, you have the power to regenerate dead hearts and deliver lost sinners. And when you determine to build your church through us, weak vessels, you will do that through your word and by your spirit. And we thank you for this church. We thank you for TCB, uh, TCBC and what you're doing here. We thank you, Lord, for the nine years of your faithfulness. We thank you that you are being exalted week after week among weak vessels. Would you continue, Lord, your hand of blessing? Keep your people faithful. Continue to show yourself as glorious. Continue by your spirit to help these beloved faithful saints to glory in the Lord Jesus Christ and boast in Him alone, to always be enamored by His beauty in the middle of lesser lights that often seem bright. We thank You, Lord, that we trust in You, that we hope in You, that we hold out Your mighty gospel, whether it's here or in India. We bless Your name for Your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Amen.